Let's go online as well. Well, I'm here grateful for God's word and grateful that we get a chance to look into it today. As I mentioned, we're in the midst of the Christmas season. There's a lot of great things about the Christmas season, but beyond a doubt, the greatest thing about the Christmas season is that we get a chance to celebrate and to deeply meditate on the coming of the Son of God into the world. Think about that for a moment, that the Son of God has come into the world. Now, in order to understand this, and we're going to uh, really undertake a great series over the next several weeks, you're going to have to understand two important words, and you're going to hear these words over and over again. One of them you've already heard multiple times today. The first word is Advent. Everybody say that with me, Advent. Advent, A-D-V-E-N-T. Advent simply means arrival. It is the eager anticipation of an important arrival. Think about somebody that you are excited about seeing, you're anticipating, maybe them coming into town for the holidays. Or think about the arrival of an important figure. Well, there is no more important arrival than the first Christmas. The first Christmas was the eager arrival as the world waited with bated breath for the fulfillment of the promise of all the Old Testament scriptures that God was going to send a savior king. He was gonna send a Messiah who would rescue men and women that would change the fortunes of Israel and through that, change the fortunes of the entire world. And when Jesus comes on that first Christmas, his arrival truly changes everything. Which leads to the second word, and that is incarnation. How many have ever heard that word before? Incarnation. Now, incarnation is a big word that comes from a Latin word, and it means literally in the flesh. Incarnation in the flesh. It is our way as Christians of explaining what the coming of Jesus into the world means, that God is with us. That's why we've named this series Emmanuel, God with us. And that's profound. When you think about that truth, it is profound. One theologian I was reading in preparation of this message, J.I. Packer, maybe you've heard of him before, he put it this way, that the incarnation is so uh, profound that the more you think about it, the more staggering it becomes that God stepped into the world so that he might have relationship with you and with me. I was talking to one of our staff members earlier this week and he was sharing his salvation journey and he says, I was raised Catholic and uh, didn't really have a, a relationship with Jesus at all. And then I heard the gospel that I could have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ and that was radical to me. That totally changed my life, and my perspective on the world. Maybe it's hard for you to see God's love because of all the darkness and all the brokenness that surround us. Maybe the heaviness of life is so overwhelming that it's like a mountain and it's hard to see over it or around it. But through this series, what I pray will happen is that you will see the great lengths that God has gone through so that you can know his love that you would sense his nearness, that in a room, an auditorium full of hundreds of people like we're in right now, that he came for you. I've said it before and I'll say it again, that God loves each one of us as if there was only one of us. Jesus is coming to the world so that you might know him. And I pray also that the awe and the wonder that comes along with Jesus will be uh, increasing your life. If you're already a believer, I pray that you have not lost the awe and the wonder. Why do we sing? Why do we gather? Why is this season so glorious? Why do we want the world to know? It's because we're in awe of him. And if you have not yet seen the glory of God, today I want you to see the glory of God. And I want you to turn with me, if you will, to John's gospel. John chapter 1 is where we're going to kick off this series called Emmanuel. And if you uh, don't have your Bible, don't worry. We're going to uh, uh, be looking at the screen. There's words on the screen. You'll be able to see that and follow along. And there's a Bible in the seat back in front of you. 
But it's an interesting thing asking people to see God, to see his love, to see his goodness, to see his grace, to see him. And why is that interesting? Well, the Bible goes to great lengths in the Old Testament to establish that no one has seen God. And no one is seeing God. To see God would be so overwhelming that none of us could sustain that. And the Bible says that as much in verse number 18 of chapter 1. If you look at chapter 1, it says these words in verse number 18. No one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God. And if that was the entire verse, that would be a pretty bleak story. That would leave us like most religions out there with a creator who is distant and far off, so holy that he cannot be bothered with his creation. But that is not the message of Christianity. You see, in Christianity, we serve a God who we profess to be both transcendent above his creation, but also intimate, very much involved in his creation. So the verse goes on, John writes, no one has ever seen God The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. The King James Version puts it this way, that the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, has made him known. While God the Father has not been seen, God the Son has made him known to us. Jesus Christ has made God known to us. And as we see Jesus, we see God in all of his glory. And we see the increase of the awe and the wonder that provokes us to worship and that drives us to mission. I want you to see God, and I want you to know that that's what John wanted us to see. He wanted us to see a God who is so in love with us that he laid down his life so that we might experience not only salvation in the world that is to come, but the the presence and the power of his grace here and now. A God who knows that we have a real adversary And we live in a real broken world. And that in order for us to make it through this real broken world, we need abundant grace. And so all of it, all of the grace and love of God has been made available to us through Jesus. Now there's two things that John wants us to behold. And we're going to look at four verses. But let me just say this, that uh, all of verses 1 through 18 of chapter 1 is what you would call a prologue to the Gospel of John or an introduction to the Gospel of John. To put it another way, to understand the Gospel of John, you must understand the points that he is trying to drive home in verses 1 through 18. If you miss what he's trying to drive home in verses 1 through 18, you will miss the entire Gospel or the whole point of his Gospel. So we're going to look at four verses, but these four verses will help us to drive deeply into what John's intent is. The first thing that he wants us to see is the person of Jesus. He wants us to see the person of Jesus. Look at verses 14 and 15. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. John is very clear in what he wants us to see. He wants us to see the glory, the glory of God. Now imagine being an Israelite who had been raised in a community in which the glory of God rested in the temple in the holies of holies. And but one could go in into the holies of holies, the high priest of the uh, Jewish people, and, uh, and but once a year. And uh, imagine that glory being made accessible now, being made visible now to all the world, to each and every one of us who desires to know God. How is that possible? Again, J.I. Packer, the more you think about it, the more staggering it becomes. What is this glory? Well, Moses asked God in one one point in their relationship, he says, if I have found favor in your sight, let me see you. 
I, I don't want to just receive commandments from you. I, I don't want to just receive rules from you. I, I want to know you. I want to have an intimate relationship with you. And God responds to, to Moses and says, here's what I'll do for you. You, you wouldn't survive it if I just exposed you to all of my glory and unfiltered in an unfiltered way. But what I'll do is I'll allow um, my back to pass by you and I'll declare my glory to you. And what did he declare his glory to be? As his radiance came by Moses, what he declared his glory to be was his goodness and his attributes. He says to Moses, my goodness is passing by you. And then he begins to declare who he is, that he is rich in mercy, that he is slow to anger, that he's the God who saves. And this is what the glory of the Father is in Jesus. In Jesus, the fullness of glory dwells. It is all of the goodness of God and all of his attributes wrapped up in bodily form. This is who Jesus is. And he brings goodness to us in a world that knows brokenness and abuses and mistreatments. And maybe you've been through those traumas at the hand of people who did not exercise the love of God. Jesus comes in and he uses his hands not to harm but to heal. He uses his words not to tear down but to give life. He comes and he introduces to us the goodness of God. And whether you know it or not, this is what your heart has been yearning for. That you've been looking for the goodness of God. And for some of us in all the wrong places, in drugs and alcohol and sex and nightclubs and all of these places where we will not find the goodness that our souls long for, where we will not find the glory that our hearts so eagerly desire, it is only found in one. It's found in Jesus. And so John wants us to understand who this Jesus is. Who is this person that's worth worshiping? Who is this person that's worth giving my life to? Imagine for a moment if somebody came up to you and said, uh, you should trust and put your faith in Bob. <laughs> what would be your question? Who in the world is this Bob? And why should I trust him? And I don't think our minds process how weird it sounds to the non-Christian for us to come to them and say, you should trust in this guy named Jesus. Their minds are processing just like ours did when I said, trust in Bob. Who is Jesus? Well, I'm glad you asked. John says it this way, and the word became flesh. Who is Jesus? The word became flesh flesh. Well, that provokes maybe some other questions, subsequent questions. Who is the Word? Well, I'm glad you asked because that takes us back to verse number one of this prologue. And in verse number one of this prologue, it says, in the beginning was the what? Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. This word is very important for us to understand. Now, John, in the original Greek, uses intentionally, he selects a word here, logos. Now, logos in the Greek mind, now we're going to go to philosophy class for just a moment, but bear with me because I promise you it's going to get really practical in a moment. But logos in the Greek mind was the ultimate reality that stood behind all of creation. The way that the Greek mind understood the way that the universe worked is that there was the physical things that you could see, touch, taste, and feel creation, but behind that was a ultimate reality, a logos, a logic or reason that explained not only why we were here, but how we were to live. 
And they believed that being blessed, being blessed meant aligning your life with that logos, coming into alignment with the reason and the rationality that stood behind and undergirded all of the universe and all created things. Now, they have various uh, schools of philosophers that uh, had various opinions on what that logos was. What was that rhythm or rationality or reason for all things existing? But all of men were trying to align themselves with that so that they might be blessed. Now, all of that sounds very lofty, and by the look on your faces, I've just confused two-thirds of you. So let me try to make it as practical as I can. And I'm going to borrow an analogy or an illustration that Tim Keller once used for this passage, and I love it. How many have ever used a space heater before? Anybody ever use that to, to warm up a room? Well, you know, the space heater can be great, but it can also be dangerous. So it comes with a manual. And that manual really is the logos. It is the logic or the reason for which the space heater exists. And it explains how to properly use it. And if you read that and you properly use the space heater, you benefit and you enjoy the warmth of that in your life. But if you misuse it or ignore or don't properly align with the logic and the instructions for the use of the space heater, it could burn down your house. And so it is with the Logos. That when we are aligned with the Logos, we experience the warmth and the blessing that comes along with that. But when we aren't, it can burn down not only our home, but it can burn down our lives Well, John wanted his original audience and us by extension to know this, that the Logos was not some impersonal, rational logic or thought, but that the Logos was a person, and that person is Jesus Christ, that the Logos is the pre-existent son of the living God, and that to align yourself with the ultimate reality that sustained the world was to put your faith and your trust and your hope in Jesus. And when you do that, friends, when you trust in him, you experience the benefit of the warmth of a relationship with God. Having a relationship with Jesus changes everything. It brings hope. It gives peace. When Jesus shows up in our lives, he does not show up empty-handed. He brings mercy and he gives purpose and meaning. And how many can testify to that being true? But he wants us to understand the the two natures of this Jesus. First, that the Word was with God and the Word was God. This is John establishing right out the gate the divinity of Jesus, that he is divine. That to understand Jesus is to understand him not as some Uh, simple um, succession in the prophets or some great moral teacher only, but to understand him as he proclaimed himself to be, that he is divine. He is the preexistent one. That's why in verse number 15, John bore witness about him and cried out saying these words, that this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Now say that tongue twister 12 times. That he is after me, meaning that he was born after John, but he was before John, meaning that he was the preexistent one before John, and he is greater than John because he is divine. That when Jesus comes into the world, that is not the inauguration of his existence. He existed before he came into the world. As the Word, as the second person of the Godhead. This also establishes for us, by the way, Trinitarian doctrine. This Trinitarian doctrine that um, there is one God, that Christians stand on this, that there is one God. We are not polytheists. We are monotheists. We believe that there is one God. Can I get an amen? amen? Just checking to make sure I'm in the right room. Right? We don't believe in, 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 in multiple gods. 
But we do believe in the triunity of God, that this triune God, that within the one being God, there eternally exists three co-equal, co-glorious, co-eternal persons, namely God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so when he says that the word was with God, he is saying there's a distinction between father and son. The father is not the son. The son is not the father. Neither are the spirit. But they live in community within the one being, one essence. They live within community, ever loving one another before time began. And it was out of that loving communion that creation happens and light comes and the world is made and the galaxies are born and the stars are flung out of the loving communion that they have with one another. Let us not confuse it. Jesus is no created being that while he is distinct from the Father and the Holy Spirit, the word was with God, the Father. He was God, that he is fully God. And to establish this, he goes on in verse number three to say, all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In other words, He is the uncreated one who makes all of creation. Oh, I love this so much. And I know we've gone from philosophy class to theology class, but this gets really practical. And here's where it gets really practical. I think of the words of Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, that in Jesus, the infinite has stepped into time. That in Jesus, the eternal has become present with us. That in Jesus, the Almighty was born of a woman and that he who sustains the universe was held in the arms of his mother. Think about the beauty of that. Think about this. One of the most famous lines from the Chronicles of Narnia, which it should be required Christian reading, by the way, is that there once was a manger that held one that was bigger than all the world. But that manger in which Jesus was born into could not contain his glory. He was bigger than all of the world and that through him all things were made. Now, why is this important? It's because after establishing Jesus' divinity, he says these words, Back to verse number 14, that the word became flesh. Everybody say that with me. Say flesh. Flesh, you and me. Flesh, a person that this divine one took on flesh. He came and he dwelt among us. And friends, this is what makes Christianity so utterly unique. You find me a religion. You find me a faith in all of human history that boasts of a God whose creation declares mutiny against him. And yet because of his great love and commitment to redeeming his creation, steps into creation and lays down his life, paying the penalty that was rightfully ours so that we might be reconciled to him. You see, this was the problem in all of human history is that our sin had separated us, had alienated us from a holy God. And this is why establishing both his divinity and his humanity is so important. Imagine stepping into the cosmic courtroom of heaven and we are sitting there under prosecution and you see this, that the judge is ready to raise the gavel to render us guilty, and we are. We're guilty of all of it. There's no accusation that can be levied against me that I'm not guilty of. Pride, guilty of it. Lust, guilty of it. Lying, deceit, all of it. And not just me, all of us are fall guilty before, before God. This is what should provoke within us not greater judgmentalism, but greater hum- humility as we look at a, at a sinful and broken world. But all of us are sinners. And then you look across from us, and there is God. And he is holy, and he is perfect. 
And so how do we reconcile this problem? All of my sins have been in the front against the holy God. How do we reconcile, reconcile enmity between God and man? We need a God-man. And praise God that Jesus is the God-man that reconciles God to man and man to God so that we might have relationship with him. How many praise him for that good news? All right, let's go on. So then he doesn't stop there. He doesn't want us to just see the person of Jesus. He wants us to see the work of Jesus. What did he do? What does this man do? It's great that he's divine and a human and all of these wonderful things, but what did he do that makes any difference? Well, verse number 16 tells us from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth has come through Jesus Christ. Then go back to verse number 18. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Man, this is so good. John is saying that you can't save yourself. And again, unique in Christianity, it starts with this premise that you can't do enough to save yourself that we do good works, not in order to earn salvation, but we do good works because we have been saved. Let me just put it this way, that, that grace is you getting, me getting what we don't deserve. It, it is the powerful love of God. And, and what John says is that you and I have received grace upon grace. Now, now, that's a writer's way of saying, man, how do I explain this in a way that their heads don't explode? Right? How do I explain the over and abundant grace? This is John's way of saying, you and I have gotten mega grace. Like, he, he repeats himself, grace upon grace, not because of senility, not because of forgetfulness. He repeats himself because he wants us to understand the magnitude of it, that the grace that you have received and that I have received in the coming of Jesus is the greatest gift of all. It is a gift that cancels out all of our sins. How do I make up for all of my mistakes? How do I make up for all of the, the things I've done wrong, all of the people I've harmed? How do, how do I fix that? There's no rewind button on a remote of life. How do, I, how do I do that? Well, we have received grace upon grace. You see, the law, he says, came through Moses. And what's the purpose of the law? Well, according to Romans 6 and 19, the law comes so that all of us are without excuse and, and to render us all guilty before God. The law is perfect, but all the law does is show me how much of a rule breaker I am. There's never been a rule I've been given that I wanted to keep. As a matter of fact, if you want me to break a law, give it to me. <laughs> if you want to expose the sinfulness of the human heart, all you got to do is to tell us not to do something and, and what's going to happen. All right, we're going to do that very thing because who are you to tell me I can't do what I want to do? After all, I'm an American. <laughs> right? That, that's just kind of how we think, right? That's humanity. We've all been lawbreakers. So how again do we reconcile with God? The law came through Moses, but grace and truth have come through Jesus. Jesus comes and says, I'm going to fix the brokenness problem, your relationship with God, but I'm not going to stop at that relationship, but I'm going to fix all your broken relationships. If you let me, I can fix your relationships with God. I can fix your relationships with others. I can fix your relationship with creation. I can even fix your relationship with you. You see, all of it was broken when sin entered the world and entered your life. That's why we can't get along with people. That's why we're in enmity with God. That's why we even hate ourselves. And the hatred of ourselves is evidenced by the sinful things we do that bring destruction into our own lives. But yet Jesus heals all of that, grace and truth. And, and in a world that tells us we can either choose grace or truth, he tells us that his grace does not compromise his truth. The truth is we all deserve the judgment that God has issued as a verdict. All of us are sin, sinners and, and, and deserving of death. But yet grace says, I'll take that 
upon myself. So Jesus goes to the cross after living a sinless life. And you know the story. He dies and he does not stay dead, but he pays that penalty and he gets back up again with all glory in his hands. And he says, come to me if you're weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest and you can receive from this cup of grace. So what is life throwing your way? Whatever it is, it is not greater than his grace. For where sin abounds, grace does what? Much more abound. Praise God. So the sad thing is, is that the way most of us understand salvation is wrong. We understand salvation and we have the wrong equation. My good friend Jeff Mannion, who pastors a, a great church, Ada Bible Church in Grand Rapids, says it this way, that most of us see the equation of salvation as do equal salvation. That the more we do, that if we do more or try harder or help more people, that we can earn our salvation. We can't. We receive grace upon grace. So the equation is not do equal salvation. It is done equal salvation. He has already done it. How many praise God that it is finished? He has already done the work. So my question to you today is can you and have you received the grace of God today so that you can have a relationship with the one who loves you more than anyone has ever loved you and the one who can restore and fix everything that's broken in your life? Today, I want to invite you to join me as we participate in communion. And you should have received a communion receptacle. And I ask that you would open that receptacle. And as you do, I want to read some more glorious words to you, maybe some of the most powerful that have ever been written. And it comes from Romans chapter 8. The Apostle Paul writing in verse number 37 Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Our victory is not because of our own strength. Our victory is because of the strength of the Lord. So if you're feeling overwhelmed in life, don't worry. There's strength beyond yours, the supernatural grace of God. And then he goes on to say this in verse 38, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can you say amen to that? And the Bible says that on the night in which he was betrayed, that he took the bread, took the bread with me, and he broke it, representing his body. And he says, this is my body, which is broken for you, broken for you. This do in remembrance of me as often as you eat it. Let us partake together. Afterwards, he took the cup and he says, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. That word covenant means promises. He made a promise, the greatest of which he would never leave us nor forsake us. And he says, I signed that promise with my blood. It's an unbreakable promise. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. Now he closes that by saying, as often as you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. That means we need to tell somebody about it. So I want to invite you to stand with me. I invite you to stand all over this church. And I want you to think about who you need to tell. Who you need to tell this week about the love of Jesus. Is it a friend? Is it a neighbor? Is it a family member? And as we close today, I want you to think about who you need to tell about the good news of Jesus and let's go tell it on the mountain, friends. Over the hills and everywhere, let's tell it the love of Jesus. Amen? Give God praise.